everybody. We're the good doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Aaron. I'm Dr. Kristen. You are all very welcome to our YouTube channel. We are social scientists with PhDs who love talking about popular and lived culture. We educate about empathy and inclusivity by having conversations about a whole range of things from systemic racism to misogyny to tropes in Bridgerton and all that falls in between. We love having conversations not only with ourselves, but also with you guys. So make sure to like and subscribe and share and tweet and comment below so that we can have conversations with you too. Today is part of our Good Doctors Diagnose series, which is when we take things that are being buzzed about in the culture and look at them through our social science and lived experience lenses, and then we diagnose them. This is for Monday, March the 15th, and we're going to be talking about female warriors in HBO's, or sorry, HBO, in Disney Plus's, I'm just thinking I stream it, um, yeah. <laughs> in Disney Plus's The Mandalorian, and a little bit of how it was different than the way female warriors were treated in Marvel's Endgame movie, um, and kind of what that looks like. So Dr. Hinson, yeah. what's up with The Mandalorian? Yeah. Um, whatever streaming service we found it on, we have loads, folks. And then they're like merging and I don't, like Disney owns Hulu now, y'all, it's a different thing. Oh, there's a, like, all of a sudden I have a Paramount. I think that was CBS. I don't understand. <laughs> so, the two seasons exist of the Disney Plus show, The Mandalorian, which is adjacent in the Star Wars universe. It is new content um, that is... It takes place after the end of episode six or the third movie in the franchise because they did four or five and six first. Um, so that's where it's located within the timeline of it. Um, and it follows the main protagonist, the Mandalorian, who is a part of this race of bounty hunters. And then we learn way more about what what it means to be a Mandalorian and that this person isn't really Mandalorian. He was a foundling, it's a whole thing. He finds another foundling that looks like Yoda, but his name is Grogu and he's a Jedi. A lot of things happen, um, but that's the two seasons of it. It's um, created by and run by Jon Favreau of the Marvel fame and uh, specifically Iron Man, but then um, showed up as happy in a lot of the other Marvel franchises. Uh, and clearly very much he's a huge fan of the Star Wars uh, and the universe. And there was a lot of new material in this, but also a lot of shout outs to those of us who've been watching Star Wars since we were five. Um, don't get, I was just like so excited about some of the, some of the things that were happening on the show. Uh, big, uh, nostalgia shout outs are a big part of Favreau, but was the thing that we love about this show and like in, in a larger part, the Star Wars universe and specifically they've done really well in the last couple of uh, films with Princess Leia and some other characters, Kelly Marie Tran and, um, what's your woman's name? Daisy Ridley. Daisy Ridley. Yeah. Um, but I think the Mandalorian goes a step ahead of those even in terms of just creating the world and living in it. We talk about this a lot with fiction and that's why we wanted to bring this up. We both recently finished watching the Mandalorian as we're filming this a little bit late to the party, but still here. Um, and shout out to Dr. Kristen's brother, Brian, for mentioning this as something we would like about the show. Brian, you were right. And I think, you know, it was one of those examples where they just said, this is a world in which warriors exist of all shapes and sizes and genders. And these women never had to talk about the fact that they were women or identified as them and they were not treated as less than or different. They were some badass lady fighters. So we get several, we get Cara Dune controversially played by Gina Carano. We're not getting into that today. Uh, we get Fennec Shand by Ming-Na Wen, the armor for the Mandalorians. And then we get some Mandalorian warriors and then the fabulous Rosario Dawson as a Jedi master uh, Ahsoka. So some really great casting, ladies of color, warriors to boot, even though some of them are alien races, but they're still ladies of color in alien races. 
Whatever, so, whatever color got paychecks, like I'll take it. Like, like color got paychecks. We love the diverse casting. Um, but I think the the thing that I think I want to hammer home about this before you share your end game comparative thoughts um, is that Star Wars has come a long way in terms of of gender and even the way that it dealt with Princess Leia in the in in episodes four, five, and six, and the way they dealt with um, her at the end and some of the other fabulous women that they cast in the last few movies in in starring and not starring roles in positions of authority. And I think the intentionality of that in just saying this is the world we exist in is a lot like Schitt's Creek, just saying we're going to create a world where there is no homophobia. And I love that they intentionally said we're just creating a world where anybody who has fighting capabilities can be a warrior. Um, and it's, it's not a small thing that they normalize that. It's not a small thing that they're going to make action figures out of these women as they make action figures out of all the others as well. So uh, big ups to the Mandalorian on that. There, this is an example of a job done well. An example of a job done not as well or slightly problematically. Our dear beloved Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the complicated and problematic end game. For a long time, women in the Marvel Cinematic Universe were badasses, but primarily love interests. Um, Peggy Carter is a whole lot more than just the girl that Captain America was supposed to go on a date with when he crashed the Valkyrie. But that's kind of what she's like within the movies. That's still kind of what she was known for. And then that's her ultimate end game and I can't get into how they treated Cap's storyline it's just still too fresh so um, <laughs> two years later it's still fresh <laughs> it's still, I'm just so angry um <clears throat> anyway we get Pepper Potts who is a total badass in her own right and then is through what we actually know as a lot of Gwyneth Paltrow's scheduling conflicts still doesn't show up as often as she should if she was really Pepper Potts um and and it's it, there's a lot like that so the very first time for my money that we got a female character who was not supposed to serve as any level of love interest really was in Ragnarok when we met when we met Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie and that that was she was primarily herself um and that's it and now she's the king of asgard and i personally would love to see her with captain marvel but that's a whole other ball game and that was great then we get black panther yes in which there was just very casually an entire race of woman warriors and one of the reasons that black panther is so successful as a movie is that it is the realized world with no explanations or apologies mm -hmm. and we just that is wakanda that is Wakanda and we're done and we're good. And they all embodied it and it's all beautiful. And the rumors that Reggie John Page might be in Black Panther 2 is very uh, hopeful to both of us. Yes. So we love that, that piece of the franchise. Other than that, like even Hope in Hope Van Dyne in the Ant-Man franchise, and I mean, Jane Foster in the Thor franchise, like it's all been kind of very love interesty. And then they even gave Wanda a love interest and it all just became very much. So then we get two really great moments during like cinematic cheering, like we all roared in the theater moments in the final battle of Endgame. And one was when, the, was when all the warriors come through the circles. Yes. And I will absolutely never forget the Wakandan battle cry and like everybody in my theater I saw it opening weekend started saying it along with everybody we were very caught up and it was very powerful very um moment in cinematic and I will forever watch every video on Twitter that like takes that as an example of like something else happening like Meghan Markle and like Peter is Gen Z on TikTok like I'm here for it anyway Always. but then the other moment that a lot of people were really excited about was this like all female Marvel character line yeah and in the moment lots of people cheered and it was great and i was one of them that was really fun and then you walk away from endgame and you're like oh that was their feminism tick box <laughs> <laughs> oh oh that that was it now we're done got it the russo brothers very famously don't know how to tell stories about women and not on the same level that uh aaron sorkin doesn't but <laughs> 
still on a level where they don't know how to tell stories about women. And so they wanted a lot of celebration for that moment. They wanted a lot of kudos, the picture of the Russo brothers who are the directors of that movie. And then all the women in that scene show up every, shows up every year on International Women's Day and on Mother's Day on all the Marvel social medias. Like they want a lot of praise for that moment. Yeah. And that moment was really cool. But there were so many things like, for instance, that was the first time we saw Pepper Potts as a physical warrior, even though canonically she had had an Iron Man-esque suit at that point for about 10 years and had yeah. never used it. And so they didn't do the lived in stuff. It was all for shock value and all for cinematic value. There's some similar stuff that happened with women in Game of Thrones as well, that it was a lot more about the shock value and the tweetability than it was about the lived in experience of what women would be like in that universe. And so absolute shout out to my brother for sure, who started telling me to watch Mandalorian approximately seven weeks before it premiered. <laughs> um, and it took me a little while to get there, but he's totally right in how Favreau created the world. And I'm not surprised looking at how Favreau has treated women in his other movies yeah um and including the Marvel ones that he's directed <clears throat> and the his attempts to make them full-bodied human beings um and definitely not perfect all the time there's some other stuff he did earlier in his career that I go but especially recently as he's gotten more and more production power I see him leveraging that for realized worlds and I'm glad for that so women in Mando thumbs up women in Endgame neutral to thumbs down. Um, and as we record this, Falcon and Winter Soldier has not premiered yet. So I will say that if Sharon Carter, who is in the show, is only a love interest, I will eat a pillow. It's going to make me <laughs> so angry. Yeah. And I mean, we didn't even get into the WandaVision of it all. I haven't seen WandaVision. Um, I've been following what it's about. And Dr. Kristen has been keeping me abreast of, of what it deals with. But I think we both feel strongly that they didn't do a lot with Wanda's character that they could have in this show. Um, but I mean, the impetus of this show is that, you know, not taking away from anything else that the show might have done, and I haven't seen it, but like, I just, when you were talking about Wanda, um, the impetus of this show is that she is so upset at the loss of her partner that she... she has a break a mental health crisis essentially without any spoilers that's yeah. that's what happens the spoiler is even more problematic than that but like even that is a problem even that is a frustrating statement for the legacy of women in marvel exactly yeah and i think like you know whatever the show does and doesn't do well i can't talk about it because i haven't seen it yet but just that that was the driving impetus the core idea to start the show they are still centering her story around that relationship. Oh, you know, I should say, I mentioned Captain Marvel. I cannot remember if Captain Marvel came out before or after Ragnarok. So forgive me in my timeline of things. I think it was after. After, but I think Ragnarok was 2016. 17 maybe, because Civil War was 16. I do know that. And then uh, it was International Women's Day. So maybe it was International Women's Day 2018. 2018, okay. So obviously Carol Danvers is not presented as a, as a love interest. Forgive me. I was thinking I was I in my in my talking of women in Marvel. I did leave out Carol Danvers. Apologies. And who she is in Endgame is is great. And I and she saves the universe because she's the most powerful entity of anything. Um, and I can't wait to see where they go in uh, when she shows up in the next set of Marvel movies. It's going to be great. One of the things with the next Marvel major franchise, which is called The Eternals, that's supposed to come out this fall, is that there are more women in it. And the movie was directed by a woman. Um, and so we will be keeping our eye on women in nerddom, as you can guarantee. Don't you worry. So we'll be back with this. But right now, John Favreau, great, great job, job, buddy. buddy. We, we know you watch us religiously. So hi, thanks so much. Um, and uh, Marvel Studios do better. And we'll see you guys next week. We'll see you next week. Take care. Mm -hmm.